Well, congrats on today. Thank you. It feels uh, really great. It's a really interesting community, and there's so much energy in there. Um, what I thought was interesting, covering tech and humanity, is you know normally at this developers conference, you are trying to get people to pick up their phone more and more. You guys are announcing all <laughs> sorts of things that people are interested in and will make them pick up the phone. You guys announced a tech addiction tool that will almost help us limit our screen time. Um, and the yeah. idea is maybe put down the phone a little bit more and limit our time. So what's the thinking behind well, that? You know, we've never been focused on usage as a key parameter. We want people to be incredibly satisfied and empowered by our uh, the devices that we ship, but we've never wanted people to spend a lot of time on them or all of their time on them. And you know, the, it's a personal thing as to how much is too much. We thought a lot about this and we're, we're rolling out great tools to both make people aware of how much time they're spending and the apps that they're spending them in, but also how many times they pick up their phone, how many notifications they get, who is sending them the notifications. All of this kind of information, I, I think, you know, empowering people with the facts or, or will allow them to, to decide themselves how they want to cut back or if they want to cut back. So how, how about you? What was, uh, did you, you use this feature? Did, it's, it's called yeah. screen time, you use this feature. So tell me about your own tech habits. Yeah, what did you I, learn? I've been using it and I have to tell you, I, I thought I was fairly disciplined about this and I was wrong. When I began to get the data, I found I was spending a lot more time than, than I should. Like where? And, uh, well, <laughs> I don't want to give you all the apps, but just too much. <laughs> and the number of times I picked up the phone were too many. Uh, I also found that the number of notifications I was getting just didn't make sense anymore. You know, notifications started out to be something to tell you about something really important happening. And uh, all too often now, it's, it's like everything is important. And uh, so I, I think these tools, everybody should decide for themselves. You know, we're, uh, we're, not, we're not forcing our view on anyone. Uh, we're giving people the data, and, and I hope that people really uh, spend time looking at it. We're, we're building it into the operating system, so it's simple. You don't even need to, to download an app. You just need to open it and look at it. I mean, when did you start designing, when did you realize that the smartphone, that the iPhone had become more addictive than maybe you guys had planned for it to? When did you start designing these features? Well, the, the, we started with parental controls when we launched the App Store. And so this is not a new focus of ours. We've been focused on it since 2008. And it's not so much the device I don't think is addictive in and of itself, it's what you do on it. It's the, uh, these notifications that you're getting, the number that you're getting, the amount of time you're spending in certain apps. And whether the word is addiction or not, I don't know. I'm not a, a, a clinical expert to tell you that. But I do know that a lot of people are very worried about how much time either they are personally spending or their kids are spending. And we wanted to give them the tools to both show them the facts and then some tools to limit. So you can set a limit, you can set your budget, just like you might set a financial budget, how much time you wanna spend in this app. And once you hit it, uh, you have to decide to give yourself more time and it forces you to make a decision. And uh, I think this is a wonderful thing for people. I know you've always been interested in tech and humanity and yes. ethics. It certainly seems, I know you guys have always had parental controls. It certainly seems like there's a very specific moment in time right now where we were all raw, raw tech for so long. And then you see everything that's happened in the last year, whether it's the weaponization of platforms, whether you know it's privacy issues, and we're all kind of scratching our heads. And then we talk about addiction and, and you know what this is doing to mental health. Mm -hmm. Do you feel an ethical obligation now? Well, yes, and but, but keep in mind what Apple has always been about. Apple's always been standing at the intersection of technology and the humanities. So we've always infused humanity into our products. We think uh, deeply about what they can be used for, how there might be some unexpected consequences, and, and try to do things for them. And, to, to both prevent them, but also allow the great things that can occur. And so I, we've never been uh, uh, not focused on that. It's, it's, a, it's a constant focus. And, and you know, I think we've made another contribution today, but it's alongside of many others that have been made over the years. 
you see Apple making these de decisions, you know, based on, you know, if this is impacting us. Do you think that tech companies are in a, a position right now where they can self-regulate with some of these more sticky issues? Well, I, that's, a, that's a big topic. I, generally, uh, for me, I'm not a big fan of regulation. I think self-regulation is the best. But, but when it's not working, and in some cases it's not working, you have to ask yourself, uh, so what, what form of regulation might be good? And, and I, I think that uh, it's a fair question that many people are asking at this point. What kind do you think isn't working? Well, I think the, the privacy thing has gotten totally uh, out of control. And I, I think most people are not aware of who is tracking them, how much they're being tracked, and sort of the, the large amounts of detailed data that, that are out there about them, nor about the companies that, that uh, possess the data. Is that part, part of the announcement, and I know this is getting tons of chatter online, part mm -hmm. of the announcement was giving users the ability to block tracking, and yeah. specifically there was, you know, there was the image of, of Facebook up there. Um, is this Apple stepping up where other companies aren't doing the job? I mean, what was the thinking behind giving, because it's, it's certainly a very interesting moment to make this announcement. Yeah, we're, we're not focused on any singular company. We're focused on the practice of tracking people when they don't know that they're being tracked. And I don't mean that there's not something in a deep embedded in a privacy policy somewhere. These things have been written by lawyers, not for the rest of us. And, uh, and so we are, what we believe is one of the most offensive things is when you are on another website, but this website that you were on three or four times earlier is still tracking what you're doing. We don't think that, that that's reasonable for people. And, uh, and if you sign in with a credential that you're using on one site, we don't think people are consciously making the, the decision that everything that they're doing on that site should be known either. And so that's what intelligent tracking prevention does. It doesn't uh, prevent tracking from the website that you are really interacting with. Mm. Do you think, I, I mean, it's interesting to hear you say that. I, just having covered a lot of this over the last months, I keep coming back to this fundamental question, and you can tell me if this is too philosophical mm -hmm. for you, but I come back to this fundamental question, do we as users just have to re-envision the idea of privacy? Is it a luxury at this point? No, to, to me, and we feel this very deeply, we think privacy is a fundamental human right. So that is the angle that we look at it. Privacy from an American point of view is one of these key civil liberties that define what it is to be American. And I, I do think that we have to look at what has occurred and begin to uh, make some substantive changes uh, throughout the industry to, to protect people's privacy. If it's a fundamental human right, do you think the last year has shown that that fundamental human right could be under attack? I think it has been under attack, and we've been saying that for quite some time. And I, I think that uh, it, it is uh, partly that there were no rails, uh, partly that people that things happened, and people didn't anticipate the the end result of some of the things that happened. And, and so, I, I don't think at this point it's it's healthy to point a finger or anything like that. I'm more uh, focused on how can we make the web an unbelievable place for not only ourselves, but, but more importantly, the kids that are on it. I mean, when you, when you look, I mean, a report just came out. Uh, the New York Times put out a, a story saying Facebook shared personal user data uh, with device makers, including Apple. Um, and I know you guys, Apple has responded saying it used the data, allowed users uh, to post photos uh, for Facebook opening mm -hmm. the app. I mean, can you tell us today that that data wasn't used in any other way? It wasn't used in any other way. Let me be that clear about it. The, uh, there were th first of all, there was data mentioned in the article that uh, we've never had, uh, ne never had, uh, never received, and never want. And, uh, and I think everybody that knows us know that that's the case. And so there were some foreign things in there that are very foreign to our company and our philosophy. Uh, what we did was something to make it uh, convenient for users to share a photo or something like that, and, uh, but uh, not some of the other nefarious things that were talked about. So what do you say to consumers? Because I want to give you the opportunity, because mm -hmm. I know yeah. everyone always just scratches their head when they hear privacy data. Now you have Apple thrown in the mix, and I, I know this is something that you care very strongly about. 
What do you say to consumers who feel like the decisions about their privacy are being made behind closed doors without their consent? Even a company like, even with a company like Apple that prides itself on privacy and user data. Well, I would take exception to that that's what we're doing. We're, we write our privacy policies in, in plain language around the world so uh, people will know exactly what we're doing. And we're not in the business of monetizing your, your data. If we can convince you to buy an iPhone, we'll make something, right? And, and so our, we are not uh, intent on building this mother of all detail profiles you it's just not what we do we don't we don't think that you want us to do that and and so I, I, I would first of all try to try to convince them that uh, we're on their side we're the trusted advisor and company here uh, in terms of the but the general issue I would agree with the people are not aware fully of how their data is being used who has it, and I think this has to be addressed in, in a deep way, in a, in a thoughtful way. What is that way? Give us a solution. Well, I don't think there's a simple solution. I, I think uh, in some, you know, uh, Europe has passed regulations called GDPR that is, uh, I think they've defined as sort of a first big step. And uh, now a number of companies, or anybody doing business in Europe, is now subject to these. And there will be some advantages that everyone will have around the world because companies will begin to, to do some of those things around the world as well. But I, I, I think we, as a society, we have to, to pull ourselves back for a minute and say, what about yourself do you really want people to know? Uh, what do you want them to keep about you? And uh, we have to start being fairly precise about that and, uh, and, and stand up for our rights. Um, one of the interesting points today, and I know this is an issue near and dear to you and to Apple, mm -hmm. um, you guys created a pride feature for Apple Watch. Yeah. Um, you know, just this morning, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Colorado, uh, Colorado baker who refused to bake a cake in celebration uh, of a same-sex couple. Uh, as a leader in the community, as Apple has, you know, mm -hmm. continuously stood uh, in front of LGBTQ rights, what's your reaction? Well, I haven't read the opinion, and so I'd reserve the, the right to read that and deeply understand it before sure. I'd comment on it. But in terms of the general topic, we believe that everybody should treat everybody else with dignity and respect. And, and that's, that's how we run our company, that's what we expect of each other, and that pertains to all communities, including the LGBTQ community. And so that's, that's the way that we look at it. I mean, how do you view your role as both a business leader and a strong advocate uh, in this community in an, administ an administration that's been more insensitive, some would argue has been more insensitive towards the community? I think I have a uh, responsibility and obligation to help people. I mean, that, I think that is why we're all here on Earth at the end of the day. And one of the ways that you uh, help people is advance human rights, uh, that your generation should always advance human rights. You know, we've, we've struggled uh, as a country and, and before that as to arriving at that spot where everyone is truly treated equal. We're not there yet. Uh, but I, I, have, I tell you, I am so optimistic about America, and I, I think uh, over the arc of time, we head toward a, a great place. Tell me um, about the importance about, of the developer community here, because I think the developer community, <clears throat> people don't know, you know WWDC and what it is exactly, yeah. um, but this community is vital to, to Apple. Even as you guys near a trillion dollar valuation, this community here today is incredibly important to you guys. They're, they're hugely important, and for your uh, viewers, they write the apps, most of the apps uh, that you will find on your iPhone and iPad or Mac or watch or TV. And so these folks here are 6,000 that are representative of the 20 million around the world. And they do incredible work. They uh, typically focus on their passion. Uh, I met a group of students uh, a couple of days ago that were really focused on already what they could do to, to help others. They were working on accessibility things so that deaf people could use their apps. Uh, they were working on notifications for the police to find out where people are in the case of a disaster. I mean, lots of things that, that really, I, it makes my heart sing when I think about the younger generation already focused on these things. 
And I, I mean, let's look at a lot. You said today that um, there are people from over 70 different countries yeah. here. Um, what role has immigration played, and are, are you concerned at all with a lot of the stricter immigration policies? I know you've been outspoken on DACA. Yeah, I think uh, my, my view on DACA is the, the Congress needs to fix DACA, and fix DACA to me means allow everyone to, to stay in the country and stop this uh, ridiculous discussion that uh, people brought here as kids shouldn't be allowed to stay here. I think and this to is, a degree, being separated uh, and, at the border. And so I think the I think the DACA thing should be fixed, and I think we we should fix the uh, issue where there's huge green card backlogs and people not knowing whether they're going to be able to stay or not. Um, my, look, my view as a country is, as a uh, country, we should have a goal of having the smartest people in the world here. That's what is great for America. More jobs will be created and all the rest. And so I'm a big fan of a open, and I don't mean open border, but a, a very open immigration policy that does allow the, the best and the brightest to come here. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we move in that direction. And when you look at the company nearing a trillion dollar valuation, that's astounding. I mean, for you personally, how does that feel? I don't think about it. To, and that's at all. To be, I don't think about it at all. I mean, for, for us, we believe that if we do the right thing for our users, if we put them at the center of our experience, which we always do, and, uh, and we're focusing on innovating and delivering the right products, that the results, which are things like market cap and revenues and profits, that that, that will come from doing these things right. So we focus over here. Right. And, um, you know, before I kind of end it, I, I know that there is this fear of the impact on consumers and will iPhone prices go up if there's an escalated trade war. I'd be curious to know. I know you said you were optimistic before. Are you still optimistic? I am. I am very optimistic because uh, no one will win from that. Uh, it will be a lose-lose. And uh, I, I think that w w when the facts are so clear like that, I think that uh, both parties will, will see that and, and be able to work things out. Do you think that if that were to occur, that iPhone prices could go up? I don't think that iPhone will uh, get a tariff on it, is, is my, uh, my belief. Based on what I've been told and, and, and what I see, uh, I, I just don't see that. Um, I saw that one of the reasons you decided to join the company a, a long time ago was you loved Steve's uh, his ability to look at tech and its impact on humanity yeah. um, and wanting to do the right thing for humanity. Yeah. You are in an extraordinary role as a CEO of this company right now because there is the ability to impact humanity. Um, and we are coming out of a complicated year where we've seen the power of tech and there's some really complicated questions. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's not fair to ask this, but having known him so well, how do you think he'd feel about this moment in time? You know, on, the, on privacy, uh, it, Steve had a very clear view there that people should know uh, who was getting their data and what it should entail. And I, I think he, he put enormous emphasis on that. So that this is not something new that just happened when I became CEO. We've always had it. In terms of the broader issue of humanity, that was his philosophy. That is the DNA of this company is that Apple should always be trying to, to change the world, and change means make it better. And, uh, and so that is the thing that we get up in the morning and, and focus on doing. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't see that changing. Uh, that, that is, that is the, the, the North Star that keeps us going. Um, I, the one thing that's so fascinating about you is you're a CEO who you're not afraid to speak your mind. You've taken stances on things, whether it's the LGBT community, whether it's privacy and speaking out uh, about that. Are there any circumstances, any circumstances that moves beyond Apple that you could see yourself going out there politically? Because you're a very well-liked <laughs> CEO. I got to ask I'm, it. <laughs> I'm not political. Uh, I, I am, and I'm, I'm not sure I would really do well in that environment. Uh, I think that I can make the greatest contribution uh, doing what I'm doing, and um, so that, that's how I feel about that. So that's a no. I, I don't see it. I, I don't see it. Um, I, I just, I love getting things done, and I don't love the political uh, machine in the background. And uh, it, regardless of which party is where, it does, I mean, I'm, I'm just making a general statement. 
and, uh, and I love Apple. It is the privilege of a lifetime to be leading this company at this time. And last question, what do you tell people who are worried about this moment, who are, I'm worried, I know for me personally, I am worried to, to get screen time and to look at how <laughs> much time I spend on my phone, which is an extraordinary amount of time. This is a sticky time. What do you tell people who are worried they're addicted to their smartphones, who are worried no. about tech's impact on children? I think ultimately uh, each person has to make the decision when they get their numbers as to what they would like to do. And, and I encourage everyone to look and everyone to make an informed decision and ask themselves uh, if they're picking up their phone 10 times an hour or 20 times an hour, um, maybe they could maybe they could do it less. Maybe they would be more present in the moment with less. Maybe if they're getting 200 notifications a day, maybe that's a little too much. I don't know what the numbers are. It's different for each of us. And, uh, but, but I think the power is now shifted hmm. to the user. And that has been what Apple has always been about, is giving the power from the institution to the user. And uh, I am, very hopeful that great things are going to happen from this. It's really interesting because there's this idea who's in control, man or machine. You believe that we as human beings, we can control. I absolutely do. I, I don't subscribe to the machines taking over the world. And I, I don't worry about that. I, I worry much more about people thinking like machines what do you than mean? machines thinking like people. Well, that's interesting. What do you mean? I, I mean uh, forgetting the humanity in things. Forgetting that our, all of our products should be infused with humanity. Forgetting that we have a broader obligation to society. Uh, I mean, these, these things. But I, I, I do not fear uh, machines. I get the sense that that feels very personal to you, what you just said. It does. Why? Uh, because it's the reason I'm on the face of the earth. <laughs> so that makes it really personal, right? That this is, this is the role I play. I think the data gives you the power and the you can't it doesn't lie hmm. it's just the facts hmm. and and so i think it's i think it's a very powerful moment for people when they begin getting it hmm. uh, for me i look at the th other things that are monitored in my life the watch has been unbelievable for me yeah. i can no longer say oh I did this workout, it really, it was really hard. Now the watch knows. <laughs> and uh, I use a, um, a, a app from a company that we bought called Bedit to measure my sleep. This was one where my view of what I was doing and the reality was totally, right. was a huge difference. Wow, well, I'm and, gonna uh, be optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the idea of taking control back. But the power is in the user. And that, is, that has been, if you think about Apple, we, we made video editing software that only very rich companies could afford. We made it so that consumers and prosumers could afford. Yeah. And so this whole, this repeats itself over and over and over again.